Hello everyone and welcome to what's new in ITIL 4 webinar brought to you by WebAge Solutions. So welcome to the session. So what's new in ITIL 4? Today we are going to cover topics of what's our current IT reality and what is ITIL? So for those of you who may not have a background in ITIL or familiarity, we'll cover what it is how long it's been around. Um, then we'll talk to the key elements of the new released ITIL 4. And we will talk a bit about what's changed. So what's changed from the previous versions of ITIL? Uh, the, uh, the existing version is ITIL V3. We'll talk about your paths for training and education and, and professional certification, so you have an idea of that. And then we will have a small section for questions at the end. So let's get right into this. Uh, myself, so just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Abby Wiltsey, and I've been working with IT service management uh, way back, so when version one of ITIL was first released. And I have had the pleasure of consulting or training um, and helping people make this best practice real in their organizations um, in fairly every sector of the industry, so um, oil and gas, healthcare, uh, financial, uh, as well as uh, public sector as well, so working with various government organizations and or not-for-profit to help them to stand up their services, their IT services. So it truly is an international certification when you do receive your, your certification levels, and as we'll see, IDLE itself as a best practice has been around for many, many years. So it's not going away, and it is, quote, and I'm putting little quotes in the air, the de facto standard for uh, service management and how we manage and deliver IT services to our service consumers. So our current IT reality, I think we're all living through this right now. Um, we have different perspectives. So users um, are challenged, there may be slow response times, um, they may be having to call service desks over and over again for the same issues, they get challenged when they do because they cannot get um, uh, answers on progress on their calls. Um, and I think today what we see as well is the users are more and more sophisticated. Um, our expectations from a consumer perspective um, for our corporate IT service and service support is no different than our expectations as consumers when we use platforms that are digitally enabled like um, like Airbnb or uh, Amazon or any of that that we've made good use of lately. From a finance perspective, there's always the challenge that, um, you know, looking for that value, where is the return on investment? Um, we, we constantly have this perception of IT as a cost center where we need to cut costs and do more with less. And, and yet IT is becoming that true digital uh, strategic um, competitive advantage to a lot of organizations lately with the di digital transformation and disruption that we're seeing. CIOs, um, they're dealing with market space changes. Um, we need to rapidly transform. And I, I think we've all gone through this in the past few months. Um, I, I always say, you know, digital transformation hasn't really come from a lot of CIOs or CTOs or CEOs. It was driven in this case by the exceptional circumstances of the pandemic um, with a lot of us working from home and a lot of shifting business models to change into digital platforms. So we, we're, we have this need to rapidly transform either for competitive advantage or because of some of the external um, influence and factors um, that are out of our control but we do need to respond to in the market space. And also from a CIO perspective, I, I've also heard things like, well, we're agile, so we don't want to do any process. Um, and so um, looking at all these various best practices that are out there, 
and questioning the need for something else or or why would we continue doing this versus something uh, a different approach like agile so we will talk about how idle 4 is a convergence of these best practices in place today and then sadly from the IT perspective uh, the complaint there is well you know especially from operations we are the ones that get the call when things go wrong. Um, people want things on demand, immediate. They want quality service. Um, we're not always in the loop. We don't know that there's been business changes, perhaps. Um, we know what needs to be fixed, but we don't have the money or the time to fix things. So this is a lot of our current IT reality out there today and what we're dealing with. So what is the problem? Underpinning this is, from the IT perspective, um, a lot of times we don't have good data to base decisions on. Now, when I say good data, it could be actually the quality of the data or accessibility to the data to create the information and derive the knowledge that we need in order to make good, sound database decisions. Um, also, we sometimes don't understand the business priority or it gets lost in translation somewhere along the way. So it's very difficult to us um, to prioritize and we do the best we can in IT, um, but often it's based more on, on, on the moment and, and our own uh, perceptions of, of the situation. IT is expected to support the business, but is often not in that early loop of uh, at the at the planning table to be able to understand what is the strategic element here, what is the strategic focus of the business, and why are we delivering these IT services? Um, how are they being used? Um, IT staff tends to be working reactively and um, we always have these changing priorities we're dealing with and it's this balance about responding to change and demand from the business while maintaining that stable environment to deliver to service level targets that are expected. Um, there's also another element that has slowed our ability to respond quickly. So. Um, velocity is that term there. So velocity is speed with direction. You'll hear a lot of discussion about high velocity IT organizations lately. Um, that's also recognized in this best practice and I'll talk to one of the training paths associated with that as well as part of the best practice. But what has slowed our ability to respond quickly and or to have slow velocity is this concept of technical debt. And the idea here is for the sake of time, we apply a workaround instead of permanent fixes to solutions. Um, these accrue just like the interest on financial debt accrues over time. So we spend more time um, uh, dealing with these workarounds, dealing with these perceived issues and you know why isn't it fixed, all, all of this different challenge and that tends to slow down our um, development capabilities especially if the fixes are needed in our platforms, in the environmental platforms, in the infrastructure platforms and um, so it can slow down our development and it can slow down uh, operations ability to get out of that reactive mode and into the more proactive mode and become part of the uh, development life cycle, truly part of that development life cycle that's required to um, deliver these high-end IT services that are expected today. So technical debt um, is a challenge from the IT side and we also have very much um, cultural uh, and uh, functional silos. So what that means is that um, uh, in IT, we tend to be very specialized. We have our own, we have the network group, we have the infrastructure group, we have you know, very specialized groups, development, et cetera, application management and support. And those silos create issues with uh, cross-functional, uh, what we call value streams. So it causes issues with um, having a service mindset, understanding the customer experience from an end-to-end -end perspective. So we have these functional silos. And not only do we have functional silos for organizations that have adopted a uh, process-based approach to best practice um, that you could even have process silos 
So where the processes are intended to be integrated and work together, like change, man or change enablement and configuration management and release management and deployment management, that they tend to be siloed themselves. Um, and also uh, culturally, you can have silos. Um, it's just it's just part of the way we do business. We are not we don't um, typically do cross-functional teams, or we haven't adopted that more agile kind of approach. So these are some of the challenges from the IT side. Now, not only are there challenges on the IT side, there are also challenges from the business side because the business is perceiving IT as an overhead or an expense that could happen. That still happens today and they do not look at IT as that critical business enabler although in today's world most of our services are IT enabled in some way shape or form any of the decisions for improvements etc may not be um, aligned to business strategy because of that lack of involvement of IT at the business table and to often sometimes decisions even from a business side are made on technology alone okay we've got this new product go ahead and support it now IT and so the business is not working with IT on an ongoing basis um, in that partnership mode to be able to achieve its own business objectives leveraging our IT services so why is this important um, and, 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 and challenging. Well, the services do make up um, the largest segment of world economies, which is, is very interesting from that a, a perspective from the World Trade Organization. Most of our services today have some aspect that are IT enabled and the technology just keeps changing and advancing. Um, we've got cloud computing, blockchain, machine learning, all different elements happening out there that we can leverage to improve the business um, uh, the business to achieve their outcomes and their goals and their main objectives um, and IT itself in a lot of organizations become that actual business driver and the strategic differentiator um, in a competitive market. So you, you look at uh, organizations like Airbnb or Uber or Amazon or Etsy, um, they, they are completely uh, digital organizations is the term that we use for them, digital organizations. and this capability of IT service management that's captured in the best practice is is really strategic to success in, in today's environment um, with the rapid pace of change and the adoption of the new technologies and understanding of just how much uh, technology can enable that business outcome and become that strategic differentiator for businesses at times. So a mature service organization, what does that look like? Well, it's when IT is accountable to the business, they're able to prioritize their work based on a good understanding of how the services that perhaps may be impacted or at least that they are supporting um, are enabling the business processes and delivering value out to the end service consumer. Um, they value uh, customer perception, so they have that service mindset, that understanding of we're all together on the same journey. Um, and I'm one piece of a larger picture. I think that's the important thing. And, and they work with the customer to achieve their goals and direct and objectives. So there is a lot of collaboration. Um, there's an understanding of uh, and a cultural shift to continual improvement. Um, let's uh, uh, it should become a core competency in IT organizations uh, that uh, we do continual improvement. Everybody looks to improve, and that there is good uh, supporting uh, systems and processes in place um, to be able to enable continu a continual improvement culture. And it's one where these silos are broken down and we see a lot more collaboration. We see a lot more cross-functional teams. So walking into the agile side of things um, and even in the high performing organizations or high velocity IT organizations, you actually see product and service oriented teams put together, which is completely integrated between the business and IT. 
And you see from the IT perspective, they're constantly um, working on this balancing act. So balancing the stability and predictability of, a, of the IT environment that, that hosts our IT services, as well as responding to the demand of the business being agile and um, the, the business demand for velocity. Again, velocity is speed with direction. So this is what good looks like in IT. But the business isn't off the hook because the business also has accountabilities here uh, to recognize IT as a critical enabler of their business strategy and that they are integrating IT into their business decision life cycle um, in order to achieve their direction, their um their objectives. So it's all about um, having good collaboration, good communications, good relationship management with the business uh, and IT together to define the needs and to ensure that we're continually delivering value. And it's a concept we use in ITIL called co-creation of value because each side needs to achieve value in this relationship. The business in this case, in a mature organization, um, is considerate of IT requirements. Um, so is considerate of the way IT needs to do business and that balancing act of stability versus responsiveness. And they work as an active partner of the IT service management team. So um, for all of these practices that we'll take a look at and some of these capabilities that come along with service management, um, IT service management, understanding and, and adoption and application, um, the business is a key stakeholder in this. So this is what good looks like. Idle itself is very simple. It's just a collection of best practice. So what that means is um, it it's an it's proven practices from an IT organization that have worked. And the whole idea here is that if we can look to a, a publication or a set of books that can talk about efficient and effective ways to, to uh, implement service management solutions um, and how to manage that IT infrastructure uh, with a, this service mindset to be able to deliver value, then why reinvent the wheel? Let's take a look and, and use the best practice as a starting point and move from there. So ITIL stands for IT, uh, Information Technology Infrastructure Library, and it really is just a set of books that collects this best practice. I think the biggest takeaway that a lot of organizations achieve through um, uh, committing to adopt ITIL uh, through the training programs, et cetera, is that you build a common language. And this common language is global. So regardless of where you are in the world, how um, global your organization is, when you speak um, uh, service management terms, people understand what you mean. Um, it is consistent. And uh, what you'll see about ITIL is it's really focused on having a service mindset, being respectful of the customer experience and the user experience throughout the service journey, and um, always being aware that there is a holistic integration of everything we do to deliver these services successfully, to deliver value, and to co-create value between the service provider and the service consumer. So it really is this uh, a solution for the whole organization. It's platform independent, so vendor independent. It, it doesn't matter what type of, of infrastructure you run, um, what type of services you uh, strategically source, like cloud, et cetera. Um, it, it applies, uh, and it applies in any industry or vertical. So it can apply to private sector, any of the industries there, and or public sector or nonprofit. Uh, it's just that your articulation of the objectives and success are a little bit different uh, given your environment, but the best practice still applies. So that's what ITIL is. Idle itself, uh, as a best practice, has been around since the mid-80s. So it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. And it is um, 
very widely embraced globally um, by the service management community and by most IT communities and organizations. So in the mid 80s uh, was version one. It was very much um, an introduction to process-based management. There was 10 core books that talked about each process and or function like service desk or incident management. And it was really uh, independent process focused. In 2000, version two was released and, and those 10 books were merged into two core books called Service Support and Service Delivery. And it introduced more of that independent process-based focus uh, to managing and delivering IT services. In 2007, version three was released and there was a, a edition uh, release of 2011 that was in that is still in the market space. And with version three, what was introduced was a life cycle approach. So there was five books that contained the best practice that covered each of the phases of the life cycle. So we had service strategy, service design, service transition, service operation, and continual service improvement. And that life cycle and the phases of the life cycle were enabled by 26 key processes and, and very much that service life cycle focused. Now with idle 4, this was introduced in 2019 with some of the early, uh, the foundation level course and, and now we're into the intermediate level courses. Uh, what idle 4 brought to the table was recognizing that there are multiple complementary best practices out there, such as lean, DevOps, agile, We'll talk a bit more about those as we move through. But what it did was it backed away from the life cycle approach and said this is truly a service value system approach. Everything is integrated. Everything is holistic. Um, you pull one piece, it affects another piece. Um, almost like that old saying, the butterfly wing flapping somewhere um, affects halfway across the world. So we will take a look at that service value system and what that means. We expanded um, the processes from 26 processes into what now is called 34 practices. And I like that change in terminology because pra a practice, so a practice of service desk or organizational change management includes not only the processes and procedures um, to enable that practice, but it also includes the competencies, the skills, the roles, and the um, uh, enabling technology to be able to deliver, let's say, changes in the environment successfully. So you'll see that's a bit of a change for those of you who had visibility to version three before. Well, again, we'll talk in more detail on what those practices are. Um, so we did, uh, Idle did integrate the, the um, other methodologies and um, also brought along what it calls guiding principles. We'll take a look at those two and they're really um, kind of guardrails, I'll use that term, or, or guidance to be able to take decisions within, within an organization and they can be adapted and adopted as makes sense to the organization. And it is a value chain delivery focus. And the value chain, we will see the service value chain is part of the service value system approach. So Idle has been around for a while. It's not gonna go anywhere, anywhere soon. So good from your investment um, in your professional career, any training and in your choice of adoption for an organization. So back in 2011, uh, it was realized that uh, there was a, an addition release and things just have continued to change rapidly within IT. Um, the technology changes, the business environment has changed, customers' expectations change. So Idle needed to change. And with Idle 4, um, there was this need to um, align with the other best practices for IT that were in the market space. So things like Agile and DevOps, um, 
uh, there was changes in uh, technology. Some cloud computing is more prevalent now. Um, artificial intelligence, AI ops, and, and chat ops, and all the different machine learning opportunities that we have now. So there was a need for consistency to align with these changes in the industry um, and to recognize this digital transformation that a lot of IT organizations are going through um, to enable their business um, to meet this demand for higher velocity and more responsiveness to change. And um, IT itself, we, we saw, can become the business strategy itself. So we really need to understand um, IT services, how they're delivered, the supporting infrastructure for that delivery, and um, to have consistency in our terms and definitions. So again, make, having that common language Focusing on and responding to any of this technical debt reduction initiatives that are underway because a lot of organizations realize that not only with their technical debt or cultural debt, because it's difficult to change, human beings don't like change. So just saying we're agile tomorrow doesn't mean that the organization's going to change to agile overnight. Um, so we need to respond to how to how to manage that that debt and reduce it over time and um, to help to, to move to more agile and higher velocity organizations to deliver to the business needs. So that was the reason for the update. And just a quick note here on some of these other best practices. I, I truly believe that we crossed the tipping point for convergence of these practices. They were never meant to be uh, non-exclusive. They were never or mutually exclusive. They, they are truly complementary. So uh, most of these best practices are based on the lean manufacturing principles. So you see things like lean IT um, and out of lean came agile. Um, agile Scrum happens to be a very popular methodology there. Uh, DevOps has, has part of its foundation based on, on uh, both lean IT and, uh, or lean and agile. And uh, ITIL, we have COBIT control objectives for IT, which is about IT governance. And there is also one there that you might not have heard of, um, but it is becoming more and more prevalent. It's called SIAM, uh, Service Integration um, Management. It's, it's about um, managing multiple suppliers because it is very, very rare that uh, a single service provider provides the end-to-end -end service experience and becomes all so much more critical to provide that service in a greater way integrator role um, to be able to manage these multiple vendor uh, uh, service delivery chains. And what's important right now, and you'll hear this, you might have heard this term, is that um, CIOs are looking for what they call T-shaped individuals as opposed to I-shaped I individuals. And that that's uh, looking at the capabilities and competencies of individuals, typically gained through training and experience. Um, in an I-shaped individual, um, you have a deep depth, in-depth knowledge of one thing. So that's your I. But when the bar is put across that I for the T on top, what that represents is being a generalist in many areas, and then having that specialized area, either in a T-shaped or even sometimes a comb, a comb, like you comb your hair, a comb-shaped individual. So you could have multiple in-depth um, uh, capabilities, but you still have that general overall view. And that is why it's important to have a high level understanding of all of these other best practices as well as ITIL, how they fit together, how they complement each other. And that was recognized in this latest release of, uh, of the ITIL best practice in ITIL 4.
So you will see uh, the prevalence of those best practices throughout uh, ITIL as well. And it's interesting too, because a lot of people when they see ITIL, maybe even from past experience, et cetera, they, they're, well, that's just operations that doesn't apply to me. You know, I work in um, deployment or I work in development or I work in project management. Um, but that that's really not the full breadth of, of ITIL, nor the intent of ITIL. It's a key component, sure, deliver and support is always a key component of our services, but the life cycle starts far, far earlier, right back with the strategic planning, with the business for these services. So let's take a look at some of these key elements of ITIL 4. Um, we'll take a look at some concepts around services and products, the ITIL service value system, the ITIL service value chain, what's called the four dimensions of service management, and the ITIL guiding principles. So there's a lot of um, mixed use sometimes of the words services and products. So wanted to give an example from the ITIL best practice perspective of what has worked with organizations. And if you start at the bottom, you see that IT organizations have a collection of resources, either tangible or intangible. So they're going to be things like your servers, your network, your storage, applications, your people, financial suppliers, your processes. So combination of resources. And one or more resources can come together to create what's called a product. And typically of a role, they're called a product owner. And in digital organizations, a lot of focus is on, quote, digital products. For example, and you see some here, Skype, Slack, WebEx, Telephony, SharePoint, Microsoft Teams. So these products, one or more products that are based on one or more resources, come together to create one or more services. And these services are typically recognized by a role of a service owner. And you could call them, this is just an example, but in this example we're using collaboration services and desktop management services that are made up of multiple products and or one or more resources. Finally, services can be packaged together as what's called service offerings. In this case, in this example, enterprise collaboration subscriptions. So when you sign up for a service offering, which is made up of goods, um, which is made up of service actions, so how we support that service and how we manage the interactions there, and access to the resources, so providing licenses, et cetera, um, and physical access, so on. So you can see that there is a, a, a good representation here of how you design and architect services themselves, um, all with the perspective from the consumer and how they would order and how we would manage and deliver these services. So that's one new concept from Idle 4. The next we'll look at, uh, part of the core framework of Idle 4 is what's called the service value system. So it's recognizing that from opportunity to demand through to the initial opportunity and demand through to actually delivering value out to the service consumer, a lot of high level practices or a lot of high level elements need to work together to be able to deliver that value. So to transform that demand into value. And it's, uh, it, there's a good saying here, Peter Senge is the godfather of uh, systems integration approach and, and thinking, systems thinking. And he says, we live in webs of interdependence. And another um, idea around this or story around this, it, it, it's one that's floating around out there. I don't know if it's urban myth or not at this point, but um, supposedly John F. Kennedy, when he was president of the United States, he went to NASA and they were working on um, sending uh, astronauts onto the moon out to the moon and uh, he ran into a janitor and he said you know he introduced himself and he said well what's your job and you know it's kind of obvious he was a janitor but the janitor actually answered him and said well my job is to put a person on the moon so um understanding that everybody is part of that bigger picture 
and that in order to become more agile and responsive to change, we need to understand how all of these elements come together to create, manage, deliver, support, and improve our services and our service uh, value that's delivered out to the customers. So this, this core framework of the service value system describes how these activities and elements work together. And here you'll see some of them. We'll cover uh, most of them here, just give you a brief overview. Um, but we've got what's called our guiding principles um, that we can take decisions within. We have governance. So governance is at the core of a lot of the directives and constraints that we need to work within within our organizations. Um, that could be governance from a conformance, conforming to regulation, legislative, or from a performance perspective, how, how efficient and effective are we performing. We have practices, the 34 practices, that also enable um, uh, our delivery of value. And we've got uh, underpinning everything as well, uh, like the guiding principles, is this core competency of continual improvement. So always looking to improve. In the core, we have what's called the engine, the service value chain. And this is where um, the life cycle is managed and where the work and activities are produced. So let's take a look at that in a little bit more detail. So here's the service value chain. So it's a central part of the service value system. And it is the definition is an operating model describing the activities needed to um, respond to demand and deliver value. So here you see demand resulting in value. And our key steps here are plan and improve. Then we've got engage, obtain and build, design and transition deliver and support and what we're delivering and supporting our products and services. So these six steps here, plan, improve, engage, obtain and build, design and transition, deliver and support, they are the key activities that are triggered by certain value streams. For example, incident resolution value stream would trigger the engage step typically through service desk or automated, then it would trigger typically the deliver and support activities of this value chain. It might even go in a bit into design and transition, and it may also go to improve through problem management, proactive problem management. But that's the idea here. One or more of these value streams like chain, um, uh, deliver a change or uh, restore an incident or restore service would go through um, these activities in the service value chain. And the other foundational component is what's called the four dimensions model. And these are the four dimensions that need to be considered holistically when we are designing, managing, maintaining, and improving our services. So you see um, it's a holistic approach to service management. And we've got organizations and people, information and technology, partners and suppliers, and value streams and processes. So these are the core four dimensions. And they are influenced by what we call um, uh, external factors. And you can call this, this is a term called PESTLE, P-E-S-T-L-E. And you can do assessments based on this, but external factors such as political factors, economic factors, technical, legal, social and environmental factors. So they will all influence our products and services, how we manage, how we support, how we deliver, how we design, um, and, and always ensuring that we have a holistic view of service delivery by considering these four dimensions. So also, we have the guiding principles. There's seven guiding principles and they can be adapted and adopted as applies within your organization and your organizational requirements. They are focus on value. Let's start where you are. Uh, the next two are very much um, agile focus. Progress iteratively with feedback and collaborate and promote visibility. Then we have this nod to thinking and working holistically. Everything is a system. 
We also have keep it simple and practical. Don't over design. <laughs> Our whole goal here is just leverage what's what's there. Start where you are and then keep it simple and practical and optimize and automate wherever possible. That's what gets us to becoming more of a high velocity IT organization and, and being able to be more responsive and agile to the business demand. So these are the ITIL four guiding principles. Here are the ITIL um, management practices and um, they're divided into three segments, general management practices, service management practices, and technical management practices. Now you can read as well as I do, so you can review this uh, at your leisure. Um, uh, what I do want to point out is that all of version three is still here and is still valid. It's just been added to or consistency being applied. Um, I'll point out some of the key changes, but under the service management practices, that's where you're gonna see the majority of our near and dear version three processes as um, the service management practices. On the general management side, it's here we see our continual improvements, security management, knowledge management. So some of the version three, but many more have been added in like workforce and talent management, organizational change management, and recognizing project management as an independent practice. Now the idea here isn't to recreate the best practice of what's already out there. It's just recognizing that if you want more information, go to project management best practices like um, Project Management Institute um, to uh, get more information. However, this is how it integrates into the service value system of our um, IDLE best practice. So that's more the perspective that you get on these. Over on the technical management side, that's where you see our deployment management, very techni uh, technical um, capabilities expand expanded today in deployment uh, with DevOps, et cetera, as well as infrastructure and platform management and software development and management. So these are your 34 idle management practices that enable all the activities in that service value chain we saw previous. So the main differences, just uh, just to reiterate, um, between the differences from version 3, 2011, to IDLE 4. Um, version 3 is still as relevant as ever. Um, what's happened is that IDLE 4 just uh, took IDLE 3 and layered on top, recognizing the change because of other best practices out there, like lean, agile, DevOps and that it is this end-to-end -end operating model, um, digital operating model, um, to increase the velocity of IT organizations. We went from 26 processes in version three to uh, 34 management practices in idle four, and you'll see here the new practices that have been added from version three are architecture management, organizational change management, project management, risk management, workforce and talent management, business analysis, so recognizing the 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 biz, the BA BOC, uh, body of knowledge, infrastructure and platform management, and software development and management. So a little difference there, once again, adding on to. There's some minor um, process name changes for those of you interested from version three to four. Um, uh, you'll see service asset and configuration management has now been split back out into formal IT asset management and service configuration management. Change management is now, now called change enablement, which is a better approach because change management, a lot of times, is viewed as a um, bottleneck in a lot of agile organizations. However, they can coexist. Release and deployment management are split into two separate processes. Uh, deployment is an IT decision, while release, making it available, to end users and turning it on is um, a business decision. So they are split into separate processes, recognizing the DevOps best practice 
And continual and service improvement is just called continual improvement now because it's recognized we improve more than just services. We shifted from that five phase service life cycle in version three to this new service value system in version four and that key service value chain concept, that engine that drives these different activities and the focus is on value and value co-creation. The guiding principles were actually part of version three with um, the idle practitioner training and now they're included at the foundation level as a core element of ITIL 4. And the four P's of service design um, to ensure this holistic design, uh, people, partners, products, and processes are now the four dimensions of service management with the same intention. So that's some of the changes there. Let's take a look now at the certification scheme and the changes there. Um, Basically, uh, the goal of education is to increase your own professional capabilities to be able to bring value to the organizations you work within or you work with, perhaps as a consultant, uh, to establish that common language, that common foundation, and um, to help to enable that those business and IT priorities, make sure they work together. But who needs the education? Everyone. Anybody in a role that touches IT service delivery, whether IT or non-IT, should understand at least the basics and even the business, like um, purchasing and facilities management, et cetera. Um, so wide open for individuals to at least get that foundational level. For those of you who have certification in the existing V3 scheme, uh, it's completely recognized in uh, the IDLE 4 scheme. Um, it's still absolutely uh, relevant and this transition to IDLE 4 is a gradual process. So you can still take uh, version 3 courses today in the market and Axelos last I heard that they were going to give the market at least six months notice of any discontinuation of the version three um, and um, I'll talk about how you would transition over given the different perhaps um, circumstances that you are in with your IDL 3 certification. So I think the biggest takeaway here is please don't worry, um, like you're, you're, you're still valid in your IDL 3. Okay. Here is the new IDL 4 qualification scheme. So just like version 3, it starts with foundation. And then there are two separate streams that you can become uh, certified within. One is a designation called ITIL Managing Professional that is made up of completing these four intermediate courses, create, deliver, and support, drive stakeholder value, high velocity IT, and direct plan and improve when you uh, the foundation is the prerequisite and when you complete all four courses you will be recognized with the idle managing professional designation if you have that or if you prefer to take a different path there is also the idle strategic leader def, uh, designation and that is actually the same course here so if uh, the uh, direct plan and improve is um, the same course as in the managing professional and there is one additional course here called digital and IT strategy so if you complete these two courses you don't have to redo it obviously if you have your managing professional you have your direct plan and improve and it counts over here as well you would only have to take one additional course you will be recognized as an idle strategic leader. Now the idle master course, uh, we do not at the idle four level, we don't have um, specifics around the idle master course. What we do know is you will need both designations um, to start with. So this is the managing professional and strategic leader designations. For those individuals who do have their idle V3 expert, certification 
you can take the Managing Professional Transition course. It's a five-day course, and that will give you the um, recognized designation of Managing Professional in the ITIL 4 scheme. We've got more information on this. Just hang on. So here's just um, a description of the different courses. So here we've got the prereq, the foundation. So very foundational level, basic understanding, common language, key concepts. That is the prereq into either the managing professional or strategic uh, leader courses. And that is just uh, beginning being developed, this strategic leader in the market space today. But the managing professional is available where you've got create, deliver, and support on how to integrate different value streams and activities across that service value system and the service value chain to be able to create, deliver, and support services. The drive stakeholder value is all about understanding, managing customer experience, user experience, doing journey mapping, a lot of relationship management there. High velocity IT. This course is all about what makes a digital organization and how do they apply these best practices to become high velocity IT organizations. And finally, direct plan and improve. That's all about um, improvement. So all the different techniques around improvement, managing improvements. And under strategic leader, um, it, it includes the direct plan and improve, but it also will include more of, more of a strategic focus. So IT working with the business um, to co-create their strategies and to enable uh, the recognition that IT enables a business strategy. Okay. Okay, I've got some questions here, um, and uh, one of them was, um, yes, uh, the presentation will be sent out to attendees, so Brandon, thank you. Um, yeah, in indicators of a mature org. So, Young, I'll get back to you as soon as I just close this, um, just close this last slide here, okay, because there's a couple of questions just to, to move through. So, um, which courses should I take? So again, this is good reference for you all. So if you're just starting your IDLE journey, you've got no plans to go through to IDLE Expert, then take the found IDLE 4 Foundation course and then continue on um, the IDLE 4 Managing Professional Strategic Leader Stream. If you have your foundation V3, you can take the new IDLE course um, and if it's still very, very fresh to you, there is a, um, a one-day bridging course that will prepare you to take your IDL4 Foundation exam. If you have a few credits in the intermediate or practitioner levels in V3 and you want to go through to IDL Expert, then continue to take those V3 courses to get your 17 credits. And instead of taking what was called the capstone course in V3, you would take the managing professional module, um, the transition module in Idle 4. But if you are in this situation, I would highly recommend checking in with WebAge Solutions um, with your training representative to help them give you the best guidance based on where you are. I think the others are pretty straightforward. Um, I'm an ITIL V3 expert and you want to have that matching designation, then take the ITIL 4 Managing Professional Transition. And if you're a V3 master, it's still kind of on hold, but what we know so far is that um, this uh, you will need both your Managing Professional and Strategic Leader designations. Well, I thank you all for your precious time. Um, hope you enjoyed the webinar. Hope you took away one or two key nuggets. And obviously, if there's any questions at all on, on certification schemes, et cetera, please do reach out to your account rep at WebH Solutions, and they'll be able to give you uh, the information that you're looking for. So enjoy your day, everybody. Thank you, and take care.